Okay. Um, so, like I was saying, these three things usually people get in, a, in a, a, another course, a bio course. Um, glycolysis, people might too, but I'm going to go more in, into that um, because it's the formation of, of the pyruvate, which that's the main goal. Once we get into this, we can do a, a lot of different things. Um, and then once it gets converted into acetyl-CoA, that's the original or the, the starting point of all this. Once you get into here, that's where the majority of our energy is coming. So th th this whole process is kind of like the engine of our bodies. All right. Like in a car, you obviously need the engine. The engine is probably one of the most important like, parts of a car. This obviously is one of the most important um, chemical processes inside of an animal um, or a living organism in order to get energy, in order to do things, in order to think, in order to breathe, in order to have your heart pump, in, uh, in order to have your lungs move everything every function works because of this whole thing okay so we're really only going to talk about the top half of it um and then uh, hopefully at some point you have had this or you will have it at some point um so okay so i'm going to re refer back to these sheets quite often because it's it's kind of a summary of what's going on plus when we get into all the details if you start like talking about the dihydroxyacetone phosphate, you might be thinking like, okay, where was this, where did this fit in again in this whole entire cycle? Um, because if you look, there are five steps, I believe, or so, oh no, there are 10 steps, this whole process. We're going to go over all of the 10 steps. Um, and at step seven, we might be talking about something like, okay, where was that again? Why are we doing this? <laughs> so I'm going to keep going back and forth and, and, and trying to show you. So again, it's the forest and the tree example. I think everyone has heard of that analogy. Um, uh, if you're looking at the trees, you forget about the whole entire forest. All right, so here's the forest view. Then once we get into all of the each um, each of the processes, that's the tree view. So I want to keep referring to this to kind of show you. So um, on this chart is the whole thing. Uh, what happened here? So here's the whole thing. So um, this, this page right here is this portion of it right here. All right, so glucose into glycolysis to form pyruvate, which then it can go off and do other things. Again, all depending on if it's aerobic or anaerobic. Um, if it's um, aerobic, uh, meaning has oxygen, it's going to go through this path pathway. Um, we'd be willing to up, upload the work. Oh, yeah. So... Um, these uh, charts are actually on here. Um, so if you look here, here is the first part, and and here's the second part of it. And then, I mean, it's actually on the slides. So is that okay, or do you still want me to upload uh, this piece of paper? It's actually there, but I mean, I have no problem doing that. I'll save it. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So let's save it as, what do you guys want to save it as? Let's save it as um, uh, engine chemical process. How's that? Well, the whole engine. <laughs> whole engine chemical process. Uh, it'd be great. If you, okay, sure. Also, yeah, yeah. So, so in the book, if you go to, yeah, on 865. Yep. But yeah. It's fine, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot easier if you have that one page, so you can kind of keep referring to it as you study and stuff. So yeah, I'm going with that. But the whole point, the whole point is start with glucose, you end with pyruvate. Okay, that's the whole entire point of this, and it's just all these processes, which is amazing. Our body's able to do this, and it does it in a split second, which is also the other amazing thing. Then once you get pyruvate, and then it goes into, again, it, it can do a hundred things from there. Um, uh, if we have oxygen, it goes into the acetyl coenzyme A, which then goes to the citric acid cell, electron, and there's like hundreds of, of things involved in here. Um, and again, all this is happening in a split second, and we get 32, uh, you know, at the total yield is 32 ATPs out of it. Okay, and I think we talked about uh, one ATP was seven kilocals. Is that right? I believe last week we talked about. So well, like 200 steps is for one of these. Right, so in this whole process, you can do 6,000 steps. So, kind of an interesting thing. Okay, so let's go back to here. Okay. 
Okay, so start here. So we're going to talk about all the players. Um, this is basically, again, the whole process. It, it's that sheet I showed you. I'll go back to it. But from glucose, you go to glycolysis, you make a pyruvate, and it's two pyruvates. All right, because if you look, there are three carbons in pyruvate. There are six carbons in glucose. So basically what happens is glucose is changed around quite a bit, and then it's split in half. And that's why we get these two pyruvates. All right, so on this sheet, uh, right here, pyruvate. Glucose, glycolysis, pyruvate. All right, and then it goes off to acetyl-CoA. Again, we'll talk about this if it's under aerobic conditions, meaning there's oxygen in the body. Okay, if you're under anaerobic, then it gets converted into lactic acid. Right? Anyone who has worked out pretty hard, either with weights or if you're running, and you get that burning in your muscle or you get the weakness in your muscle, like if you are picking up a weight and, and you just can't do it anymore, that's because you don't have enough oxygen in your body and all of the pyruvate. So your body's burning tons of glucose and all of the pyruvate is all building up. You're getting tons and tons and tons of pyruvate, but you don't have enough oxygen in order to remove that pyruvate into acetyl coenzyme A. So what happens is the pyruvate has to get used up somehow. So it goes into a different uh, pathway into lactic acid. And that's that lactic acid burn when they say, I'm building up a lot of lactic acid. This is also how a heart attack occurs when you either have a clot or a, or, or a clog in the artery and you can't get oxygen into a certain part of the, of the heart. Technically, the heart is being all deprived um, of oxygen. And what's happening is you are building up lactic acid in that point and that, ex, in that excess lactic acid eventually, it, it, it kills all the muscle cells in that area if you get way too much of it. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about. So that's basically what happens. Glucose to pyruvate. Pyruvate has lots of, of different pathways it can go through. Under oxygen, acetyl-CoA, which then it goes into the Krebs cycle and the electron chain, chain transport um, and the phosphorylation, and you get tons of energy out under normal uh, environment um, right, conditions. But if you're working out hard, you don't have oxygen, you form lactic acid. Okay? Um, we're also going to talk about how not only will sugar do it, but obviously fat will do it. Let's say that you're on a low-calorie diet. Your body does not have enough carbohydrate in order to convert to pyruvate or into acetyl coenzyme A. So how are we going to do it? Well, you can do it from fat. So what we're going to talk about how you can take fat and break it down into acetyl coenzyme A. And one fat molecule, one fat molecule, or one fatty acid, it can make up to nine acetyl coenzyme A's. Um, in sugar is only two. But one of the, so in a triglyceride, you've got three of them, right? Three of the fatty acids. Each one of them makes nine. So one triglyceride is able to make 27 of these. That's why fat has, is so high in calories because this one molecule has uh, 16, 18 carbons on it. And each of these are two carbons. So one of these is able to make nine of these. Okay? So again, that's why fat has so much energy in it. One molecule makes a lot of the acetyl coenzyme A, where in glucose, um, one molecule only makes two uh, acetyl coenzymes. All right? And then we'll also talk about how amino acids are able to do it. That's gluconeogenesis where if you um, have a high protein diet, you don't have enough carbohydrate um, in your body, or if you are in a, star a starvation mode, how amino acids can actually be converted into glucose, which then it goes into the whole cycle. So we'll talk a, a little bit about that. All right, these are just some of the players that we're gonna talk about, uh, just the enzymes. Um, there's a, um, a carboxylase, and again, remember I tell you anything that, that ends in ACE is an enzyme, okay? If it ends in ACE, let me get my pen, I'm not even using my pen here. I don't know if that helps or, oh, I'm not in, in that mode. I don't wanna go in that mode, I'll just use this. Um, well, actually, you know what? I think I can do pen, yeah, I don't like this pen though. Are you guys okay if I don't use the pen part of it, if I just move my cursor? You guys able to see the cursor okay? 
I think it's probably easier to read than my writing. If I have to write something, I will. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So remember, if it ends in ACE, it's an enzyme. All these are enzymes. And then the um, the pre word tells you what it's basically doing. So a carboxylase, it's doing something with a a carboxylate group. There's a COO or a carboxylic acid. You guys remember our our um, um, the um, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, our functional groups. All right. So somehow it, it's an enzyme that is doing something here. It's an it, it's adding a CO2 group onto a molecule. Decarboxylase. It's getting rid of a CO2 group. Dehydrogenase. It's r removing two hydrogens. How about a hydrogenase? I don't have that here. But what do you think a hydrogenase is? That's where it's adding hydrogens. Isomerase. It isomerizes the molecule, so it changes where the, the, the bonds are. I might have a ketone, and then it changes it into an alcohol or something. Um, and then a kinase, which is kind of a common one, is which it transfers a phosphate. And when people have a blood test done, usually they check their availability of a kinase, and all depending on what that tells you, I believe it can tell you if, you, if the individual is having a heart attack or has had a heart attack, or if they're about to have a heart attack, it all depends on the level of, of, the, of, of, of the kinase. Kinases are important because they transfer phosphate groups. And that's what this is all about, basically, if you look down to it. It's transferring a phosphate onto ADP to make ATP, or break down ATP into ADP. That's what this whole thing is all about. Kind of very, very, a lot of, of complicated steps for something so simple. Okay, um, so this is now just talking about how to understand a chemical reaction. I think we've seen these before. I think they just show it in, in every chapter. Um, it just shows you the name of the um, enzyme. So it's a phosphofructokinase. So this sounds like it is uh, uh, putting a phosphate on a fructose uh, because it's a kinase. And you're going from ATP to ADP. So the phosphate is coming off of the ATP and it's going onto the fructose 6-phosphate. So you can see where you have a CH2OH here. Now you have a phosphate on there. And this whole thing is just to put that phosphate on there. Okay, so again, it's just kind of showing you that the ATP is being used and it's forming ADP. So where's that other phosphate going? The phosphate is going onto here. All right. Okay, this kind of is a summary of glycolysis, which I kind of talked about already. Uh, but basically, glycolysis is a linear 10-step anaerobic pathway. So you don't need oxygen for this part of it. But once you form pyruvate, that's when uh, it depends on it, if you have oxygen or not. So glycolysis is this process right here. This is a, a total of, of 10 steps to make pyruvate. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so steps one and five comp uh, compromise the energy investment. That means for the first half of it, we use up energy. We use up ATP. Okay, and then the six carbon glucose is then converted to three carbons, which is what pyruvate is, is three carbons, but we form a total of two of them. That's why there's two. All right. Step six is in 10. We don't use ATP. We actually make ATP. Okay, this is kind of misunderstanding here you actually get four ATPs out of it it's basically saying for each of these of the pyruvates it's two ATPs but remember you form a, a total of two of them so this is actually four ATPs okay and I think they say it in here eh, they kind of don't show it that well um, they say five because it's actually it's two and a half because of the NADHs that's a little confusing I'll talk about that in, in a bit but it's basically, it's actually twice the, the amount. You actually get a total of four here and two NADHs in reality. And I and they do talk about it, but they're just talking about one of the molecules. One pyruvate forms that, but since you form two of them, you form twice the amount. So it's two NADHs and two and four ATP. So you use two, but you make four. So overall, you, you gain it a total of two. Oh, I guess that's why they're saying two. Sorry about that. That's why they are saying two, that you actually do form two at the end. Yep. Okay, so the first part, this is basically the first part of it, the first uh, four steps, where you basically take glucose, you add your two ATPs, here's where the energy investment is, you're adding energy in, 
and you basically are splitting the molecule in half into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde phosphate. Now these also have other pathways that they can go to. Uh, we're really not going to talk about them. <clears throat> um, well, I think we are going to talk about dihydroxy because I believe in gluconeogenesis this actually will do something. I can't remember. We'll uh, when we look at the slides. Okay. And what happens is the glyceraldehyde is what it goes off to form the pyruvate. What happens is this dihydroxyacetone, if it's not needed, it gets converted into glyceraldehyde. Okay. Um, and it's with what's called an isomerase. And I know that because look here, if you look at the dihydroxyacetone, notice I have the carbonyl here on carbon two. So here's carbon one. Uh, let's just call it, yeah, let's just call this carbon one right here. This is carbon two. And then the carbon has the phosphate, I'll call it carbon three. Notice carbon two has a carbonyl. Remember, carbonyl is a double bond oxygen. Here, car, uh, carbon one has the carbonyl. Carbon one has the alcohol. Here, carbon two has the alcohol. So basically, the difference between the hydroxyacetone and the glyceraldehyde is the carbonyl and the alcohols have switched places. So, so that's why the enzyme is an isomerase. It's isomerizing the, the molecule. It's changing place of the groups. So by an isomerase, you can change the hydroxyacetone into glyceraldehyde, which then that goes off and eventually turns into pyruvate, which again is what then goes and forms Okay, I just want to remind you of the names. Pyruvate, which then goes and forms acetyl-CoA. Let's go up to here. So it goes down to form the dihydroxyacetone. Here it is right here. And the glyceraldehyde. All right. And then it's the glyceraldehyde that goes on to pyruvate. And then the, and then the arrow here is showing you that the dihydroxyacetone goes and forms the glyceraldehyde. Now, if we need more dihydroacetone, there is an isomerase that then can isomerize glyceraldehyde into dihydroxyacetone, which then that, it can go off and do its own thing for, if for some reason this is not going or I've formed way too much of the pyruvate. Um, so all these processes are able to like turn off. Like last week, um, I talked to Jonathan about, um, or a few other people about um, Le Chatelier's principle. Here's exactly where all that happens. If I get way too much pyruvate, then uh, this processes will stop, and the glyceraldehyde then has to be has to be all converted into dihydroxyacetone, which then that it can go off and do something. Okay, so all these are re reversible steps, all depending on what the system needs. Okay, does everyone follow me? I, I'll make sure you follow me because again, there's so many steps, there's so many of these fancy names. Um, when I first learned this, I remember it's confusing. I mean, I, I haven't seen this in a year. So even when I reviewed my notes, I was still like, okay, I got to remember where everything is. So I always remember to have a sheet like this just to kind of see where we are in the process. Okay. Um, yeah, dent. Yeah. Okay. So it's dense, but not horrible. Good. <laughs> Good. Okay. So what we're basically going to do is go over each individual step, but just remember the key players. So if you want to print this out or if you want to have this on uh, your screen, I guess you, have, you can't print it out yet. Um, but, um, uh, but I'll refer like, like back to it a lot. Okay. So the first five steps, four steps is to get to this, the, the, the glyceraldehyde. Okay. That's what we're trying to get to. All right. And the thing to remember is that the dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde, uh, they are, uh, three carbons each. That's because we split, eventually we're going to split glucose in half. Half the molecule forms a dihydroxyacetone, the other half the molecule forms a glyceraldehyde. So that's what we're going to talk about first. E each of these steps, uh, I'm not going to do it in a, a lot of detail, but enough that it makes sense. And then once we form this, the glyceraldehyde then goes off to form pyruvate. And you see here it says two molecules of pyruvate are formed. Because the glyceraldehyde forms it, and then the dihydroxyacetone gets converted to glyceraldehyde, which then forms another one of those. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the first four steps, right? Again, we're talking about these. Let me go up. Make sure here. Let me just go back to this. This has it here. This first step: one, two, three, four to form these two guys, dihydroxy and glycer. All right. So the first step is to put on a phosphate, phosphorylation. All right, that's obviously going to use ATP because one of the phosphates has to come off of ATP. And what's the enzyme? Kinase. Because remember, kinases are the enzymes that transport phosphates. So hopefully this is all, you know, all these fancy words now 
I was like, oh, well, that makes sense. We're putting a phosphate on, so we have to use ATP because that's our phosphate groups is on ATP. Um, and we're going to use a kinase. And why is it called a hexokinase? Hexo meaning six because it's a kinase that puts a phosphate on a six-membered ring sugar. All right, we, we learned that when we talked about the carbohydrate chapter. So hopefully all these fancy words are starting to are, 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 are starting to make sense. All right. Okay, then what we have is an isom a isomerization. And look what we're using, an isomerase. And notice what we're turning it into. And I kind of want to emphasize this just because of what we hear in the news. Bot fructose is horrible for you. You shouldn't eat fructose. Well, I want people to know that you actually convert glucose into fructose in glycolysis, which every single animal on the planet does glycolysis. All right, you need to do glycolysis. That's a must. If if you have a, if you have a, a, a an animal that cannot do glycolysis, you're dead. End of story. So notice fructose is what it gets converted to. If you eat fructose, your body actually just starts glycolysis here. It actually saves a step. Rather than going, uh, uh, rather than doing the isomerization, basically it takes fructose and it phosphorylates it. And you are already one step in. You've actually saved the step. Okay. Uh, the problem, though, is that um, when you sweeten things with fructose, you have twice the amount of fructose in your body. And fructose takes a while for it to actually get metabolized. Where glucose, it starts breaking down as soon as it goes on your tongue. Where fructose, it, it doesn't start getting all, all metabolized until it gets into your liver. And at that point, you have so much of the fructose, your body says, well, half of this is going off in glycolysis, the other half is getting stored as fat. <clears throat> and it's usually stored in your liver as fat, because it has to be processed pretty quickly. So you get a fatty liver. So that's, that's the problem. It's not that fructose is bad for you. Stay away from it. You can't stay away from it. It's impossible. Your bodies make it, and it's used in glycolysis. The problem is the amount that we eat. The amount of the fructose we eat is too high. But that's like everything. If you just eat way too much of the saturated fat, if you eat w w way too much of anything, it's, it's a bad thing. So it's not that you should stay away from fructose. You just don't eat a lot of it. Okay, so uh, it converts to fructose with the isomerization. All right. Then we have another phosphorylation. All right. So notice we, we had a phosphate here. Now we get another phosphate right here. So it uses another ATP and this time a kinase. And it's called a fructo. It's called a phosphofructokinase, right? Or a pentose kinase. Remember up here we used a hexokinase. This would use a pentokinase because it's a five-membered ring. All right, but they're just calling it a phosphofructokinase just because it's so common on a fructose. All right. So basically, we started from glucose. We, we put a phosphate group on. We then isomerized it into fructose, and then we put another phosphate group on. So basically, we took glucose, turned it into fructose, and put two phosphate groups on it. All right, and again, this happens in a split second. Right now, it's happening trillions and trillions of time. For me, it's happening more because I'm moving my mouth a lot more. So the muscles in my mouth <coughs> um, are, are, going, are going faster, so it needs more energy. Okay, so this is just a summary so far of this. So the first three steps is you put on two phosphate groups and you isomerize fructose, I'm sorry, glucose into fructose. And it used two uh, molecules of ATP. Any questions? Hope, I'm trying to make this as painless and as simple as possible. It is simple. It's just, it's so much. And so there's so much stuff going on. <coughs> All right, step four now is when we cleave fructose in half. All right, we cleave it in half, and this is where we get two different molecules. You either get dihydroxyacetone or you get glyceraldehyde. Okay, so that's so at this point we are at this point. So we've done the first four steps. So the first step, we put on a phosphate group. Second step, we isomerize glucose into fructose. Third step, we put on another phosphate group. Fourth step is when we cleave fructose into these two um, uh, into these two molecules, dihydroxyacetone and glyceraldehyde. Okay, and you can kind of see where everything, and again, these are just I, uh, isomers of each other, right? I have a C, so I have a, 
a phosphate and a CH2. Phosphate and CH2, those are identical. Here is carbonyl and then my alcohol. Here is my alcohol and then my carbonyl. So not much of a difference between these two. Okay, um, in the break, this is called an aldolase. That, that's the enzyme that breaks it. You know, necessarily have, have to know that or remember that. Okay. So now we have these two um, molecules, and then this is where we do the isomerization with a fancy name called triose phosphate isomerase. All right. It doesn't really matter the triose phosphate. Um, well, I think the triose is implying it's a sugar with three carbons. Tri three os is a is is a the ending for a sugar, which it would be right because we have a carbonyl because the sugars always have carbonyls and then all the carbons have OHs on it. So we have an OH here and we have our O, but this time we have a phosphate. So that's probably what that's implying: a three sugar phosphate isomerase. It's a three carbon sugar with a phosphate and it isomerizes. I mean, that name tells you exactly what you're doing. So we're isomerizing the hydro, hyd, dihydroxyacetone if we are not using it. Okay, so if we are not using the hydro, hyd, dihydroxyacetone, it gets converted to glyceraldehyde, which now is going to go into the last five steps. <coughs> okay, so the first phase of glycolysis converts glucose to two, to two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Right, because this is eventually is getting formed into glyceraldehyde, so we have two glyceraldehydes. So again, we are now right here in this process. These are the same steps. You can kind of see the same thing here. All right, so now we're going to talk about 6 through 10. All right, basically we're going to do an um, a oxidation. We're going to use ATP, ATP again, and then, and then for, I'm sorry, form ATPs here, and then form pyruvate. Okay, but any questions on that on those first five steps before we go? Okay, good. Okay, so now glyceraldehyde, so the dihydroxy ketone, uh, not dihydroxy ketone, the dihydroxyacetone has been converted now to glyceraldehyde. I have two glyceraldehyde molecules now, remember. <coughs> All right, and what we're going to do is we're going to oxidize this molecule. The step is oxidation because if the NAD is gaining a hydrogen, that means this molecule has to gain an oxygen. Whatever gains the hydrogen, the other thing has to gain an oxygen. So this is being oxidized because this is being reduced because it's gaining a hydrogen. And notice we're going from an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid group that has a phosphate on it. So we're gaining this oxygen, going from an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. So this is being oxidized. Therefore, my NAD is being reduced. Okay. So step six, the aldehyde is being oxidized and phosphorylated at the same time by dehydrogenase, right? It's taking hydrogens away. Um, it's taking that hydrogen away. So we form an NADH and we form the acid form, the oxidized form of the glyceraldehyde which is called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, okay, glycerate. Now we have a kinase. So what does a kinase do? It transfers a phosphate. What it actually is doing is removing the phosphate and it's making an ATP molecule. So this phosphate is coming off of it and now really forming our carboxylic acid. And that phosphate is now making ATP. So here's the first uh, time that we are making an ATP molecule. Now remember, this happens twice because there's another molecule of glyceraldehyde that is doing this. So we're forming two ATPs. You just have to kind of you, you have to keep that in mind. All right. And then the next step, let's see the next step. Next step, isomerization. So an isomerase, the phosphate group that was on carbon three, now is look is on carbon two. So look, it's three phosphoglycerate to two phosphoglycerate. <coughs> so we're using a uh, I don't know what they call it, mutase, but I guess that's implying it's mutating the molecule. So it's basically an isomerization. All right, then we have dehydration. It's called an enolase. Uh, there's something called an enol, which is where you've got a double bond and an oxygen is attached 
to the double bond, that's called an enol. So that's probably why they're calling it an enolase. But basically, you're, you're dehydrating. You're taking away two hydrogens. Um, I'm sorry, water. You actually, you actually are taking away water, dehydration. An OH and an H. So this OH plus this hydrogen are being removed as water, and you're getting a double bond there. Another phosphate uh, um, transfer, so another chirase. Kinase, in this case it's pyruvate kinase because guess what molecule we just formed? Our pyruvate, that's that's what we want. All this just to get pyruvate. Remember, we're getting two molecules of it. So this phosphate group is removed. This uh, bond forms a double bond here, and you get rid of that double bond. So I, I know it might look like an isomerization, but these enols have their own chemistry, and it's, it's kind of doing its own its own thing here. Um, but eventually you form pyruvate, which is basically a ketone and a carboxylic acid. Okay? So, just to go back to this again, here's the steps. All right, so we have a bunch of, we, um, so the NADH forms this into the carboxylic acid phosphate. We have the phosphate that hangs off. Then that phosphate gets pulled off and forms ATP. We then have another phosphate transfer we have a dehydrogenase uh, it forms a double bond there that phosphate now group is pulled off again from the ATP and that's when it rearranges eventually into pyruvate okay that's basically how to form pyruvate it took us uh, 35 minutes to talk about it and in the meantime it probably happened trillions and trillions of times inside of our body <laughs> so there you go. Pretty amazing that your body does this so many times without us knowing it. And you know what? That's one of trillions of reactions that are currently happening inside of our bodies. Which it's fascinating to be thinking about what is going on inside our bodies right now. Okay. So let's see. The two glyceraldehyde three phosphate units are converted into two pyruvate units in phase two of glycolysis. Overall, the energy generated is two NADs and four ATPs. But remember, two ATPs are used up. Okay? So the three glyceraldehyde, this group here, remember, goes to that. All right, two ATPs are used in phase one, and then four are made in phase two. So an overall of two ATPs are formed. Two NADHs are formed. Um, and then the fate of the, two pyru of the two pyruvate molecules now depends on oxygen. So like I said, depending on if you're anaerobic or aerobic, what's going to happen with pyruvate? All right. So under aerobic environment, it then gets formed into acetyl coenzyme A, which then is the precursor for all of this stuff. The citric acid cycle, the electron trans transport chain, and the oxidative phosphorylation. <coughs> all right. If we, you see how they have, if there is no oxygen, then we go to the lactic acid cycle, which we, we will talk about. I don't know if we talk about it now or where, I, I know someone in the slide we talked about it. Okay, so here's the overall. Here's kind of the summary. One glucose, so it requires a glucose, two NAD pluses, and two ADPs. All right, and the overall reaction is you form two ATPs, two pyruvates, and two NADHs and two H pluses. Okay, so remember we have two pyruvates. All right, here's just what what happens if you don't have glucose. What happens if you have other sugars? So fructose, I already told you. Fructose gets uh, entered into step three. So like I was talking about, it, you take fructose, you phosphorylate it, and then it gets entered into step three. Because remember, if we look back here, I don't have the names here, but if you remember step three, um, so step one is to put the phosphate on. Step two is to isomerase. Well, into fructose. Well, if I already have fructose, all I have to do is, is I have to put the phosphate group on, and then immediately I go into step three. So that's what happens if we already have a phosphate. All right, so it can be converted by muscle or kidney cells into uh, fructose 6-phosphate and enter glycolysis in step three. Or it can be converted by the liver to glyceraldehyde three phosphate, and, and, and oh, that I did not realize. So actually, in the liver, 
Um, if you have a lot of fructose, it could be converted into glyceraldehyde by another processes and just entered into step six. Because it, remember, step six was, again, I like is this. This is glyceraldehyde. So in the liver, it might do all this stuff for you and just start it right there for us. So we don't even have to do that whole process of glycolysis. There's a separate um, uh, function that happens inside the liver. Uh, and I'll make it. Either way, that you know, these are, are, are the key names: glyceraldehyde, pyruvate, acetyl CoA. All right, galactose, which is the um, one of the sugars in milk, and lactose as well. These sugars are actually uh, um, uh, isomerized into glucose. So galactose is converted into glucose 6-phosphate. And it's entered at steps two of the of the glycol of, of the glycolysis. However, you have to have the correct enzyme here. They say that, that there are patients that might not have the enzyme that does that, um, either for lactose if you're lactose intolerant, um, you, you don't have the enzyme in order to do it. So that sugar just kind of goes through you, and you get bloating and cramping and all that stuff because your body can't handle it and just kind of it it kind of goes through you. Um, but if you have the enzyme, then it gets converted into glucose eventually, um, and then it's entered into step six. Just remember, the first step is taking glucose and putting a phosphate group on it at the sixth position. So there you go. Mano, same thing. Manos is sugars that are found in our, our uh, in dark fruits like cranberries or currants, I, I think plums as well, in the skin of plums, so any, any kind of a darker um, ra uh, in, in grapes and raisins and stuff like that. Um, so mannose is here, it's converted into fructose 6-phosphate. So it, enter, it enters immediately into step 3. And again, this is a whole other biochemical processes that's going on. Um, but like I said, our, our main engine is glycolysis and, and, and the Krebs cycle and phosphorylation and all that stuff. So um, all these players, it's just different forms of fuel. Like are you putting in 85 or 80, you know, 87 grade or, or 90 grade? Like which grade are you putting in? Are you putting in mannose, fructose, or glucose? It doesn't matter what gasoline you're putting in, it all goes into the same spot eventually. Um, so it's the same thing. Okay? So hopefully that kind of summarizes all of this stuff right here. I mean, now hopefully you're looking at this and you're like, wow, that's that's really not that complicated. That makes sense. Uh, Steve, do you know the composition or or oral glucose given to hypoglycemic patients. I believe it's just a liquid form of glucose. I think it's just straight glucose um, in a, a liquid form. I think I think that's all it is. I don't think. Uh, sorry, like like asking if it's like phosphorylated or anything like that, or if it's like at step five or something. I mean, I think all it is. Uh, why not just fructose? I think they have that too. Um, my father-in-law has diabetes, and he, I think he has fructose tablets instead. Um, uh, or, or, or he'll eat fruit, um, or fruit juice, because a lot of those have higher amounts of fructose. I, I don't think, um, in going from glucose into fructose is going to save much more time. So, um, it's not like, oh, well, if I do fr fructose, it'll absorb a lot quicker. I think they absorb about the same rate. It's very quick. Um, if, I mean, it, if you've ever had a, had a sugar low and if you've eaten a candy bar that has sugar in it, you very quickly get a sugar high. Um, or if you have kids or know of kids at a birthday party where they all eat cake and within three minutes, everybody is spazzing out. Um, so yeah, I mean, I bet you, you can get either one. Um, I, you know, I don't think either one of them has an advantage. Oh. Over the other one. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that was more my question. Of, okay. Is, yeah. Would it be faster to use this? Yeah, I I don't think so. I don't think the absorption. Um, I, you know what? I'll check. Uh, I don't think, but let's see. Is uh, is fructose absorption faster 
then fructose. The absorption rate of fructose alone from the small intestine is slower than that of glucose. So there you go. Yeah, so actually it's slower because of the fact that, yeah, because I was telling you that fructose absorbs into our intestines, where glucose is absorbed in our tongues. It's a much, yeah, that's right. So it is partly due to the difference of the absorption process between the two monosaccharides. Glucose absorbed from the intestine into the plasma, so our blood, via more than one act, uh, active glucose. Yes, so actually it sounds like glucose is actually absorbed faster. Yeah, so it's more about the absorption of which one. So since glucose absorbs faster than fructose, that's probably better. But again, I think we're talking a few minutes of each other. We're not talking a few hours. So, yeah. Okay, and yeah, because I also know that um, usually it's a glucose tab. Um, like I had a friend in college who was a diabetic, and he, and he had these tabs, um, these glucose tabs, and, and I tried one. I said, hey, I'll, 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 it's pure glucose. I was like, oh, you know, I'll try it. And it's really packed in. He's like, yeah, let's go ahead and try it. And he knew what was about to happen. Oh, my God, I had the worst headache. And, like, within five minutes, I had this headache. I was sweating. I mean, I felt horrible, <laughs> but my blood sugar must have went up to like two, three hundred. I'm not diabetic, but still, that amount of glucose, uh, I mean, I felt awful. Uh, and so it was pretty quick. Um, so I know I'll never do, never do that again. And, 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 and he was like, yeah, I usually only take about a half a tab or I'll just bite a small amount of it off. I don't eat the whole thing. I'm like, well, thanks for telling me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. It's fast. Yeah, I mean, our, I mean, our bodies have evolved um, it, uh, in order in order um, in order to do that. Uh, note to self: Don't try. Yes, don't do that. Yes, very very good note. <laughs> but you know, college we do stupid stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, our bodies are designed like to absorb that glucose very quickly, um, uh, and also when we have the fear factor. So if our adrenaline all kicks in our bodies release a large amount of glucose in our bloodstream i think we learned about that um that's because it's quick fast acting energy um so so when you have the adrenaline uh again it spikes uh, processes in our our liver in order in order to release the glucose because that came from back in the days when we, we were hunters and you know we're sitting out on the on, on on the safari like somewhere, and all of a sudden an animal shows up, and all of a sudden you need that surge in energy in order to start running after that animal um, or killing that animal, or it's the other way around where a lion is chasing you, and our bodies need that quick rush of uh, of energy um, in order in order to fast act our our muscles. So all these processes have evolved since you know like 20,000 years ago. Um, there you go. All right, a little bit of evolution in there. Why not? That can never hurt. Okay, so now we made pyruvate. All these steps, all these 10 steps to finally get to pyruvate. All right. So glycolysis, pyruvate. Now, what happens to pyruvate? One of them is acetyl-CoA. That is under oxygen or aerobic condition. So if you have plenty of oxygen, like right now, all of us are not exercising or doing anything, or we are getting out of breath. So all of our pyruvate, all our, all our, our glycolysis, the glucose is going to pyruvate. The pyruvate is getting uh, switching into acetyl-CoA. Probably, you know, 95% of our, our our daily lives, this is happening. All right, and then it's going the electron citric acid, I'm sorry, the citric acid cycle, which is also the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain reaction. I always say electron tra chain transport. I don't know why, but it's the electron transport chain. And then oxidative phosphorylation produce all these ATPs, which makes our brains think, our hearts pump, our lungs go, us talking, thinking, moving, all that stuff, our hair growing, everything. Okay, so that's under. So right now, that's what's going on. Now, if you're actually at home and you're like, well, while I'm listening to Steve, I'm gonna ride my bicycle and get some exercise while I'm at it, which that might not be a bad idea. <laughs> um, you are going through a different pathway where you are using up your oxygen or you don't have as much oxygen and you're under now an, an anaerobic condition. All right, and it's not either one or the other. It could be a mixture of the two, right? Like if you're doing a light jog, 
you are using up oxygen, but you have enough oxygen in, in order to stay under an aerobic condition, but also a, a small portion of it uh, of, of your pyruvate because you're forming a lot more pyruvate now because you're burning a lot more energy and sugar that you're forming a lot more of the pyruvate. So most of it might be going to acetyl coenzyme A, but you might be getting a small amount of it into the lactate, which is under anaerobic conditions. Because if you make too much of this, our bodies don't like a lot of anything. Okay, so uh, eat even water. Our bodies don't like a lot of water. It's called drowning. All right, so if you get too much pyruvate, your body has different pathways in order to get rid of it. Um, so, uh, so under anaerobic conditions, we are forming lactate, or if it's protonated, it's lactic acid. That goes into the lactic acid cycle. Now, if you're a microorganism like yeast, uh, you take pyruvate and you convert it into ethanol. So that's a whole other pathway. Uh, we don't really talk about it in this class, but um, if you uh, you know if you do home brewing of some sort of whatever, those microorganisms. They still take pyruvate. They take sugar. They eat sugar. They go through glycolysis. All right. They do the whole thing of glycolysis that, that we learned. But in this case, when they have pyruvate, they uh, it then it then gets excreted eventually out of them and turns into ethanol through a fermentation process. Okay, where CO two is removed. Notice this group right here is the CO two part. Notice you have C and O two. So this carbon eventually gets knocked off as carbon dioxide, right? Has anyone ever made bread? Are, are you guys doing this sourdough thing? I mean, <laughs> every person I know in the world is making sourdough. They're all passing along um, all their sourdough yeasts. Is anybody here doing this sourdough? No, but other bread. Okay. Uh, I just know a lot of people are doing all the sourdough thing now. Um, so if you ever made bread... Um, uh, you obviously form CO2. That's what makes the bread rise. And then if you ever smell bread, you usually have an alcohol you smell in there. Um, you usually smell the alcohol, but obviously it'll evaporate once you cook it. But the CO2 is from this portion of it, and the ethanol, all right, is from this portion of it. So if you have a carbonyl, you're going to use an NADH to reduce that carbonyl. That's where NADH is going to be used to turn it into an alcohol. So that's what happens in, in that case. Lactic acid, notice lactic acid is this molecule, but with an OH here. So again, it's going to use an NADH. All right. So only NADH forms lactic acid. NADH and a, and a decarboxylase, hopefully now these names are making sense, right? A decarboxylase, I'm getting rid of a carboxylic acid group. And NADH to reduce this forms ethanol. All right. And then for acetyl coenzyme same thing we have to do a decarboxylase and then hook on the thioester okay so those are the three possible pathways pyruvate there are other ones but we aren't going to talk about them here all right so let's see what this uh, okay so this slide just talks about under aerobic conditions normal conditions <coughs> all right so under aerobic conditions where oxygen is plentiful pyruvate is oxidized to nad plus all right so um, uh, you get oxidized by NAD plus in the presence of coenzyme A. Um, you, and then eventually you form, you notice CO2 is formed. Where's that CO2 coming from, guys? From low, that group right there. And then this group, these, this acetyl group, this is called an acetyl group. A CH3 with a carbonyl is called an acetyl group, hence the name acetyl coenzyme. And then the sulfur basically substitutes for the CO2. Our CO2 gets knocked off, the sulfur will come in, and you have acylated your coenzyme A, which now goes into the Krebs cycle and blah, 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 blah. The NADH, uh, the NADH form needs oxygen to return to NAD plus, uh, NAD plus. So without oxygen, no additional pyruvate can be oxidized. <clears throat> so here's how the processes gets shut off. If you have if you don't have oxygen, you can't get rid of NADH. You need NAD plus, all right? You need the oxidized form of NAD plus. If you do not have this, guess what happens? This process is shut off. <coughs> so it's saying down here, in order to make this, you need oxygen in order to get rid of that, that hydride. So 
So you see how one processes affects another processes, which then affects another processes. So if there's no oxygen, this stays, meaning I don't form this, which means I can't react my pyruvate. And then if you're getting too much pyruvate, your body says that ah, that's not going to happen. So obviously you're going to start forming lactic acid, which I believe is this reaction. All right, notice NADH. Because, oh, I, that, that, that's right. Because your body wants NAD+, plus, it needs it. So it has to get rid of this somehow. So how does it get rid of it? It starts reacting with pyruvate to form lactic acid. Okay. So this, that is building up, right? It's building up. It's building up. I, I don't have oxygen in order to get rid of this. But this needs to get rid of this. So what does it do? Since pyruvate is starting to all pile up, it gets rid of the hydrogen by reducing this carbonyl, which is what lactic acid is. So then I can form NAD plus, so I can start doing a, a little bit of this. Because our body still needs energy. It can't just stop its energy source. But we're making so much more of the lactic, of the lactic acid. <clears throat> All right, so if, if we go back to this slide, this process he's never really stops. It's just, are we 100% here or are we, you know, 20% here, right? Um, so if 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 everything is shifted over to here, it's not 100% here. I'm still doing, I have to do this, otherwise I have zero energy, and I'll just stop and drop. Okay, I guess that could happen if you're working out so hard, the people that just drop, <laughs> I guess technically, I'm, a, I'm guessing this process is pretty close to actually have stopped completely, and your body has swamped itself of all of its ATP. Um, but I imagine uh, that's like on the on the verge of death, I, I would guess. Um, but anyways, okay, so if you can't convert to NAD plus with oxygen, the NADH plus converts it using pyruvate to form lactic acid. So w when oxygen is la lacking, there's abundance of NADH, which then reacts as a reducing agent to pyruvate. It reduces the carbonyl to an alcohol and it turns it into lactic acid. So if you are working out pretty hard you're, uh, and your lungs aren't at the capacity of absorbing tons and tons of oxygen, um, you start uh, breathing pretty heavy um, because that's your body's way of trying to get more oxygen. <coughs> and your muscles start burning. You're, you're, and, and again, that's an evolutionary thing to happen. You, your body is purposely going into pain to, in order to make you stop whatever you're doing. It's saying, hey, buddy, we don't have oxygen. We can't produce any more energy. All right. It's, it's like the engine has stopped. All right. And you don't have any more gasoline. So what happens? You have to stop, slow down. You have to, you know, you have to get a, a tank of gasoline of some sort and, and fill your car up and then have to go again. Um, so that's basically what your body is doing. Again, it's an evolutionary thing. It, it on purpose is making you have pain so that so that you stop what you're doing. I mean, I mean it's amazing if you think about how our bodies work, how, how it's evolved into this. I mean, it's all based on NADH. Who would have known? This little tiny molecule, either it has a hydrogen, it doesn't have a hydrogen, causes us to have pain, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's fascinating. Okay, so any questions on lactic acid? or anaerobic conditions. All right, and then again, this is just basically everything I've said during strenuous exercise when ATP uh, needs, uh, when your needs are higher. Yeah, on top of it, uh, it's not like you just need a regular amount of ATP at this point. You need lots of ATP because your body needs lots of energy. Your body just can't keep up with the needs. Right, so if there's not enough oxygen inhaled, then you, um, uh, in order to reoxidize NADH, um, in the and that's where it forms it in the electron transport ch chain. Your body starts building up lactic acid. Um, it makes you feel sore. You start cramping. It starts hurting, and your body stops what it's doing. <coughs> so it, it can now start absorbing all that oxygen. So an oxygen debt is created, and when the vigorous activity decreases, the person must take deep breaths of air to repay this debt. There you go. 
But then what happens is your body gets stronger, right? Every time that, again, this is a, uh, I don't know how many of you have taken anatomy and, and physiology yet, but how a muscle grows is every time that you do an exercise, it it tears your muscle a little bit. It's a micro tear. And when it heals back up, it heals back larger and stronger, meaning it has more of the muscle fibers. Every time that you tear a muscle, it repairs itself a little bit bigger. And if you tear it again, bigger, bigger and bigger, and so forth and so on. And that happens with our heart as well. So if you're doing a lot of aerobic activity and you're pumping your heart, your heart's pumping and, and uh, it's building up bigger um, and, you, and your muscles are getting bigger so that you can technically use now more oxygen. Anytime that you take an inhale in, you've got a lot more muscle, your lungs are more efficient uh, and your heart is, is able to pump a lot better. So your body is able to now hold more oxygen in it than it did a month ago. So by doing that, you, you can go longer in exercise because you have more oxygen for, for the uh, glycolysis process. But then again, it's at a capacity. So that's why when they say if you want to get bigger and stronger, you always have to get to that point where you run out of breath or that you are aching and sore. Otherwise, you aren't going to build anymore because then at that point, your body's like, well, I have enough oxygen needs. I don't, um, I don't have to worry about it. I don't, I don't have to pay back the debt anymore. So hopefully this all kind of makes sense now as, as the wildest this happens. Here's more of the, of the biochemical reason as to this. <coughs> it's not just a trainer that, uh, that's telling you. So lactate in the muscle is then reoxidized to pyruvate, uh, which can then return to the acetyl coenzyme uh, and muscle soreness, fatigue, and shortness of breath is resolved. The pain felt during a heart attack is caused by an increase of lactic acid. I think we talked about that at the beginning, uh, near the area where the oxygen has been removed. Higher than normal blood lactate level can indicate lung disease, congestive heart failure, and serious infection. All right, so uh, when they do, do a blood test, they check for lactic acid. And um, here's a perfect reason why. If you have a buildup of lactic acid in your body at normal conditions, you obviously are having a situation somewhere in your body where it's not getting enough oxygen, which I guess would imply your lungs and your heart, which would make a lot of sense. And then here they have kind of this picture showing you this area where it's been all cut off from oxygen. It's, uh, it's not really that exciting. All right, here's a fermentation. <coughs> we talked about this in fermentation. Um, uh, yeast have these enzymes, pyruvate decarboxylase. Remember I said it's going to use a decarboxylase in order to get rid of that CO2, and then a dehydrogenase. There you go. See that? So ethanol is obtained by fermentation of sugars in grapes, barley, corn, rye, whatever. Or just plain sugar. All depending on, 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 on the type of uh, alcohol. So wine is grapes, Marley is scotch or whiskey, corn is whiskey, rye whiskey. Rice, I think, is um, um, what can, uh, sake. I think sake is rice alcohol. And potatoes, I believe, is vodka. Is that correct? Vodka. Vodka. I think potatoes is vodka. So all depending on what your sugar source is from which of these fruits or vegetables is the type of alcohol. I don't know if you guys like knew that, but all, all depending on the source um, uh, uh, it comes from is the, uh, so uh, like malted barley is scotch, corn is, is, is bourbon usually, um, rye is rye whiskey, all those are whiskeys. Gin, I think, is, I know that they use the juniper berries in order to flavor it, but I don't think that's the sugar source. I don't know the sugar source for gin. Is there another sugar source for gin? I, I think the juniper berries is just for the flavoring. Um, I can't remember offhand. I wonder if it's just regular sugar. I mean, there are people who, who just take r regular sugar. Like, you can just take sugar and dump it in a pot. It's usually moonshine. Um, and then you put in your yeast, and it makes alcohol. Um, but uh, you, you don't get the flavorings of the uh, um, of the 
of the uh, fruit or vegetable in it. So like in wine, it, it has that sweet flavor f uh, from the sugar of the grapes and all the tannins out of the grapes and all that other stuff. Um, but, okay, anyways, it's not important. Okay, so here is that, um, is, is that chart that I keep showing you over and over again. Oh. Okay, so basically it just shows you, so again, we basically are stopping right here at the formation of pyruvate, which could make acetyl-CoA, or it could make lactic acid, or it could make ethanol, depending on what our processes is. But if it does acetyl-CoA, it goes into these processes, which were in chapter 23. Like I said, I'm not really gonna go over them because you probably have had it somewhere else in a biology course, or you, or you will have it in a biology course. Um, but usually people have seen these. You might not have gone in, into detail as we did with glycolysis, uh, but maybe if you do have another class and it goes into it, you'll be like, oh, I remember that. It's a isomerase. It's a kinase. It's a whatever ace. This class I'm going to ace. There you go. <laughs> Dad joke for today. Okay, so uh, first glycolysis yields two ATPs and two NADHs, which will then eventually give us five ATPs. That's what, what, where they get this five from, because these two NADHs will eventually go off into a processes that will eventually make another five of these. Um, I'm sorry, th well, three, I guess, for a total of five. Um, so I don't have to worry too, too much about that. Uh, so that's glucose to pyruvate, and then pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, all right? Makes another two NADHs, all right? And then finally, the two acetyl-CoA's that, that we form will go through the citric acid cycle, the electron transport chain, and the oxidative phosphorylation to yield another 10 per each one. So it's two of them. So it gives you 20. And then you also have these uh, a GTP, which I didn't talk about. Instead of adenosine triphosphate, it's um, guanidine triphosphate. And then the NADHs and the FADHs, which again is in these three things, which eventually one glucose molecule gives you 32 ATPs. All right, so one glucose molecule gives you 32 of these. All right, that's kind of the final. And then that's what this slide is showing you. Yep, right here. Here's where that 32 is coming from. All right, um, let me take a quick break, and when we got to come back, we'll talk about now, um, if you don't have glucose or fructose, how do you get energy? How do you get energy from fat? So we'll talk about the oxidation of fat and how you get tons of pyruvate molecules out of one fat molecule. And then we'll talk about uh, gluconeogenesis, which is when you can take proteins and you can actually synthesize glucose from amino acids which then can go into the glycolysis process. All right, so why don't we take a quick, like a, a 10 minute break, and then when we come back, we'll start back up, all right? All right, so this slide just talks about um, blood glucose levels and just talks about the two hormones that regulate the glucose. Um, insulin, everyone knows about insulin. That's if your blood sugar is too high, uh, or if you have an increase in sugar after a meal or something. And then um, glucagon, or glucagen, I think it's glucagon, is that pronounced, is uh, produced when your blood sugar is too low. So it stimulates the conversion of stored glycogen to glucose. Okay, so that's just kind of, a, I don't know why they put that in, they just have that in there. Okay, gluconeogenesis um, is the process in which uh, you, your body synthesizes glucose from a non-carbohydrate source. So remember, carbohydrates are basically our chains of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. Well, every organic molecule has carbon in it. So our bodies have these pathways of taking molecules that did not come from sugar or have nothing to do with sugar, but because they have the same um, building blocks, like carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, our bodies has, have processes that can actually take those molecules and synthesize glucose inside of our bodies. Now that is not a normal process. That is under anabolic uh, or anaerobic uh, situations. 
uh, because that's basically what plants do, right? Plants basically take um, uh, um, oxygen uh, and the and CO2 from its environment and make sugar. And what do we do? We take sugar and make CO2 and energy out of it, right? So we, we, we do the exact opposite. Well, our bodies have a processes in order to do that as well, all right? And whether it's from lactic acid or from amino acids or glycerol, uh, which glycerol comes from the breakdown of fat. So when you are under a condition where you um, limit your, uh, your diet and you're burning fat, especially if you decrease your carbohydrate um, uh, uh, consumption, if you're like on a high protein diet, the glycerol that gets broken off of fat can actually be converted into glucose. Um, and then uh, the lactate, which is lactic acid, which remember comes from pyruvate, which pyruvate, remember, came from glucose. You can just all backtrack that whole process and remake glucose from the pyruvate. And then amino acids, even though they have nitrogens and other molecules on them, we have um, enzymes and processes in our body that can take the carbon backbone off of the amino acid and remake glucose. And that process is called gluconeogenesis, where we synthesize glucose from other um, molecules inside of our body. All right. Um, so it's an anabolic pathway since it results in a synthesis of a large, so anabolic meaning that it, it, it takes a large molecule and it breaks it down into a smaller one. All right, so here's an example where you can take um, lactic acid, all right, oxidize it, reoxidize it to make pyruvate, because remember, the way that we made this is by reducing it with NADH. Well, if we take NAD+, plus, um, we can go ahead, uh, I'm sorry, in order to make NAD+, plus, well, I can take NADH and reform I'm sorry, take lactic acid, take NAD+, plus, form NADH, and then form a pyruvate, which then basically do the glycolysis backwards to form glucose. I don't think that's the processes, but that's basically what you're doing. Okay, um, so this is what's called a Cori cycle, which is basically the opposite of the glycolysis. All right, so cycling compounds from the muscle to the liver and back again. All right, so from glucose to lactate, all right, um, or we can go from lactic acid into glucose, which happens in the liver. So gluconeogenesis happens in our liver, glycolysis happens in the muscle. Okay, so this is now how we break down fat or triglyceride and how we get energy out of it okay and again the key players are pyruvate and glyceraldehyde those are the two two molecules that we are always trying to form into or the dihydroxyacetone so as long as i can get the dihydroxyacetone glyceraldehyde eventually into pyruvate all right so a Triglyceride, remember, is made of a glycerol molecule. Which remember, we said that glycerol uh, is able to actually go back into gluconeogenesis. Because if you look at glycerol, look at glycerol, two carbons, and you got three OHs on them. Okay. Well, if you look at um, glyceraldehyde, it's three carbons. Two of the carbons had OHs, and the other one has, has an aldehyde. So if you were to take this triglyceride, I'm sorry, glycerol, and you oxidize one of these into an, into an aldehyde, you basically have glyceraldehyde. So you can take this uh, piece of it, oxidize it, and immediately go from glyceraldehyde into a pyruvate molecule. Okay? Or if you take a second one of these and hook them together, you now have a sugar molecule. So you can see how glycerol... Our bodies are amazing at not having trash. It basically, if it has a carbon chain on it, our body has a way of of making it into something useful. Okay, it doesn't just say, "Oh, glycerol, I'll just throw that away." Nope, it's going to say, "Okay, glycerol, great. I can form this into a pyruvate. I can reform it into a sugar molecule. 
Um, I can I can make it into a glyceraldehyde. I can do whatever my the body needs at that moment. Okay, but we're going to focus focus on the fatty acid because that's where the energy is, is going to come from. But here, uh, so again, uh, here's the slide. Uh, I didn't realize that, that there's a slide of going from glycerol into glycerol phosphate, which I'm hoping again that sounds like it's going to go into um, uh, into uh, in this case it gets oxidized into the into the dihydroxyacetone, which remember then can get formed into glyceraldehyde. So it's basically I didn't realize that, but it, it, it gets formed into this the dihydroxyacetone, which remember can then get transferred into glycerol. I'm sorry, glyceraldehyde, which then can go on into pyruvate. Okay, so the second step involves oxidation, dihydroxyphosphate, and then we know what happens there. The product is an intermediate in both glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, so two pathways are available. That's the glycerol. Now let's talk about the fatty acid. The fatty acid has lots of carbons on it, tons and tons of carbons. Okay, so the fatty acids are catabolized by beta oxidation in a process whereby acetyl-CoA units are sequentially cleave from fatty acid. So the fatty acid doesn't go into the um, into the uh, glycolysis cycle. It immediately all right, forms it doesn't make like pyruvate. It makes acetyl coenzyme A. So fat, the fatty acids make this. Okay, the glycerol makes the product prior of pyruvate, okay? So you can see that one fat molecule um, feeds into a lot of this. And basically what happens is you're gonna take this huge chain and clip off two carbons at a time because you are making pyruvate. Uh, what is it, two or, uh, yeah, it's two. I'm sorry, acetyl, uh, I'm sorry, acetyl coenzyme A. Sorry, we're not making pyruvate. We're making acetyl-CoA. I said that before and then I said it wrong again. So we are making this. It's two carbons. It's a carbonyl and a CH3. And basically what's happening is our fatty acid, every two carbon is being clipped off uh, one at a time. And each of those two carbons are making a, an acetyl-coenzyme A. All right, so first the fatty acid is converted into a thioester, which is... So it's like acetyl coenzyme A, but it's got the whole chain hanging off of it. And then a beta oxygen, beta implies two. So it's at the second carbon. It's always happening two carbons at a time. Um, it also re requires quite a bit of energy. So ATP is using, um, it, now notice this, we're going from ATP to AMP. So two phosphates are being used every single time. Right, because you go ATP for three phosphates, ADP for two phosphates, AMP is mono. Uh, it's no problem, Ian. I'm uh, recording this, so you'll have everything. Okay, and then you basically go along. So it it shows you a whole processes here. So first the fatty acid, it, you make it into a uh, it hooks onto a, a coenzyme A. Um, you then do a reduction. So you go from a single bond into a double bond. That's what helps you break it. And then it's going to be a beta break. Um, well, then it's a hydration. It puts an oxygen now on the beta carbon. Um, and then uh, the, we just talked about the oxidation. Um, and then it cleaves it. All right leaves it off, and then another uh, acetyl coenzyme A will come in. And so there you go. We have a, so, uh, acetyl coenzyme A, and then you have a coenzyme A come, and you now have two carbons less what you originally had. Right? So it starts off as a thioester. All right? You then do a bunch of oxidations and reductions. You cleave it, and then the two carbons all spit out to form acetyl coenzyme A. And all of the all of the carbons on this chain that happens to. So so if you have 18 carbons on your fatty acid, you will form nine acetyl coenzyme A's, right? Because each one is a total of two. Okay. 
So one fatty, and, and remember, each triglyceride has three of these on it. So if you can form nine, there's three of them, 27 acetyl coenzyme A's are produced from one triglyceride. Okay, so that's why fat is so much higher in energy, because you get so many more of these acetyl coenzyme A's out of it. One glucose, remember, formed two. So if you go back to this side, slide, right, glucose forms two pyruvates, right? We talked about two molecules of pyruvate, all right? And then those two pyruvates go ahead and make two acetyl coenzyme A's. Well, one fatty acid makes 27 acetyl coenzyme A's, all right? So uh, what is that? That's like the 14 times more. Okay, does that make sense? So, it, it, so it's basically it's taking that long chain and eclipse two carbons off at a time. Each of those two carbons eventually go and form an acetyl coenzyme. Okay, so the result is a new acetyl coenzyme having two fewer carbons than the original. So this thing, it starts at 18, it goes to 16, then it goes to 14, then it goes to 12, then it goes to 10, then it goes to 8, 6, 4, 2, and each time it cleaves, it's forming acetyl coenzyme A. This new acetyl coal can be processed through the beta oxidation again, cleaving off two more carbons until finally acetyl coenzyme is present. For example, 18 can form nine acetyl coenzymes. All right, so saturated fats, which have like 20, 18 plus carbons on it, are much higher in energy, have a lot more energy to it because there's more carbons. Where if you do more of the, um, of the, uh, uh, of, of the smaller chain fats, especially like the, like the medium chain trans fats or the MCTs, which are somewhere between eight to 12, they aren't as much energy because they are smaller molecules. Um, so it's not, as it's not as many of the calories. So that's why you should use more of the vegetable oils or the MCTs is the big thing. Uh, there's a lot of other reasons, but they are technically lower in calories because they don't have as many of the carbon groups. They don't produce as many of the acetyl coenzymes. So a total of eight cycles of beta oxidation are needed to cleave the eight carbons, uh, such that every carbon of the original fatty acid ends up. So every, so no carbon is wasted, okay? So here's kind of a, a cool uh, way of showing it to you. Here's the 18 carbons in the fatty acid, and the red line is showing you where it's cleaved eventually. So um, the 18 is cleaved, you get 16. It's cleaved, you get 14. Five more cycles, and eventually you get to two. So this one thing can make nine acetyl coenzymes, where one sugar molecule only makes two. All right, so complete beta oxidation of the acetyl coenzyme derived from a uh, nine carbon fatty acid forms nine acetyl coenzyme A's, eight NADHs, and eight FADH2s. So that's the overall sum. For the uh, glucose, how many NADHs were there? Uh, there were six and two. Okay, so any questions on the fatty acids or the fatty acid oxidation? All right, ketone bodies. Here's another situation when you, ha when you um, are doing a, uh, uh, a keto diet, hence uh, the, the keto comes from ketone. But basically a keto diet is where you basically don't eat sugar. You, eat, you really limit the amount of, car of carbohydrate in your body, so your body is forced to use all of the of the um, of the fat storages, um, and you basically go, your body uses fat energy. And it's basically by the by this process, by the beta oxidation process. Okay. Um, however, what what starts happening is um, uh, we'll kind of show you how there are ketones that your body is able to produce, where your body can take the carbons of those ketones and start making. Um, acetyl coenzyme, because that's really what it, it comes out to be. Acetyl coenzyme A is really what's used in the majority of the energy, all right? Um, I don't think it goes to pyruvate. I will have to look. I can't, I can't remember, but I think it's really going into the acetyl coenzyme A, okay? Um, so, so when not enough carbohydrates are present to meet the body's energy needs, the body turns to uh, uh, 
uh, catabolizing storm triacylglycerols. The beta uh, oxidation of the fatty acids release a large amount of acetylcoenzyme A, as we said. Okay, if the citric acid cycle cannot process all of the extra acetylcoenzyme A, they're converted into compounds called ketone bodies. Okay, so this is another um, part of the cycle where it gets shut off when we have too much of something. Okay, so the ketone bodies, so here are, are the names of them. Um, acetoacetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and acetone. Um, acetoacetate is actually a chemical in a lot of our fruits. Um, uh, and it kind of has a sweet smell. That They always say that people that are in ketosis, they smell sweet, or their breath smells sweet, or their sweat smells sweet. It, it's because of the production of the acetoacetate. Um, it, it, it has a sweet smell to it. Um, I wonder if it's because your body is producing sugar so um, as, as a processes. Um, but let's see what happens. So this is now, here we go, we're forming acetylcoenzyme A. What happens if we have way too much of this? We have so much of this, these processes can't keep up with the amount of this. So this now has another side reaction in which it starts forming ketone bodies. All right, and that's when you are in the state of ketosis. All right, now, if you're a diabetic, what actually happens is all of the acetylcoenzyme A starts forming keto bodies, and this kind of stops happening, and you start having some metabolic issues. I don't know if anyone's ever known a diabetic that, that uh, started getting ketoacidosis. Um, uh, but um, it, it's actually a point where the person can't actually die. Um, it's a, a metabolic issue. Your body stop, start, stops producing energy. Um, and, it's at a, and for a diabetic, what happens is, is your body, they can't get out of this cycle. They start forming ketones, and that's all they form. And th this whole process stops. Um, so, if you, so if that stops, you can't produce energy, you're in big trouble. For a healthy individual, that won't happen. So the um, so these diets, uh, like the keto diet, if you're a healthy individual where you don't have any metabolic issues, it's really not a problem. But if you're diabetic, you really cannot do this. Or if you do, you gotta you have to make sure your doctor knows, and you are being very careful um, because for a diabetic, uh, your body doesn't have the ability uh, in order to fix itself. So you can really have some major problems. All right. So the, so the ketone bodies, what happens is the acetylcoenzyme A, here's the acetylcoenzyme A that, that's building up. Remember, a portion of it is going into the Krebs cycle and doing all that stuff. But if you have too much, there are a bunch of steps which then forms it into acetoacetate, which can be broken down into acetone or into, uh, into, into beta-hydroxybutyrate, depending on if you have an excess of NADH. So again, if your body has way too much of stuff, it's going to produce one of these three molecules. Okay. Uh, now notice that this is three carbons. What do we also know that's three carbons? Pyruvate, right? And where did pyruvate come from? It came from glucose. See how all these, these processes backtrack? So I, I bet you acetone, if you are not consuming carbohydrates, your body is going to start making it from acetone, okay? Or even from any of these, it'll break it down um, and do that, okay? So uh, ketone bodies are small molecules which are readily soluble in blood or urine. So you can actually do a urine test or a blood test to find out how many ketones you have. So the people who are on the keto diet, usually they check it. And when they are heavily into ketosis, they know their body is doing nothing but burning fat as their main fuel source. Uh, the buildup of ketone bodies in urine due to starvation, a vigorous diet, or uncontrolled diabetes is called ketosis. All right, w which is fine. Ketosis is fine. But ketosis can turn into, keso, into ketoacidosis, and this is where you can die. I mean, people die from this, even nowadays. Um, I had a friend um, who was, the, I think I told you about the guy, he was the one that I ate his sugar tablet. Um, he went into ketoacidosis, and he was in the hospital for almost a week. And he was in the ICU, and he almost died because he, his, um, he, was, uh, he was doing a lot of exercising, 
He wasn't eating enough food. He wasn't ch checking his blood levels. His blood sugar dropped really low. Um, and uh, it, it turned out that he was in ketosis for like two weeks. And his body w wasn't able to get out of it. And then when you get into ketoacidosis, that's when the pH of your blood starts changing. And that's when you start having problems as well. All right. So if you do go on a keto diet, be very careful. It's it, it's um, if you're a healthy individual, you know you're probably a little bit uh, it'd probably be easier for you to do um, or safer to do. But if you do have a metabolic um, issue at, at all, whether it's diabetes or anything else, talk to a doctor. Or, you know what? You don't really have to do it. You know, it's not it's not something you have to do. Um, Okay, and then here is a process where you take amino acids and you can convert them into sugar. So the catabolism of amino acids can be divided into two parts. The first is what happens to the amine group, so the nitrogen part of it. And then the carbons. Like I said, carbons never get wasted. All right, so amino acid, amino acid catabolism, the nitrogen goes out into, it forms urea, which is our urine. It's in our urine. The carbons, eventually, hey, look at that. We've seen these two guys a lot. We're getting sick of these two. Pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, right? That's because the, these carbons are processed. Um, they could go and form sugar, or there's another process where it just goes and forms pyruvate. All right, so this is another form of gluconeogenesis. So the first part of it is called transamination, where a nitrogen is transferred off of it. All right, and you get an alpha keto acid. All right, and then the um, uh, here's just kind of showing you an example of where alanine, the nitrogen, is transferred onto keto glutarate onto another amino acid. All right, and look what you form, pyruvate. So from alanine, all right, from alanine, the nitrogen comes off and immediately forms pyruvate, which we know pyruvate is the precursor to form acetyl coenzyme A, which can go into the Krebs cycle. Hopefully by now you are so sick at this and you're like, no, I totally know where all these are, <laughs> right? So you, you can see if you didn't do this, you'd be like, okay, what are these things again? Trust me, it's really confusing. But hopefully by now you can kind of, you kind of have a visual as to where everything is. All right, after transamination, uh, the original amino acid contains only carbons, hydrogens, and, and, and so, uh, I mean, here it goes, like directly into pyruvate. After accepting the amino acid group, glutamate is degraded. So this part of it, the glutamate, can actually even all continue on and form more of the pyruvate um, in the urea. So it's just showing you. So here's glutamate. You get a transfer of, of, of the amine group again. So it comes off as nitrogen and you get keto glutarate again, which then can get recycled back into this process again. All right, so it looks like alanine is really the major amino acid that you can form because it has the same amount of carbons. It has, has three carbons, plus it has a carbon. So, like, here's alanine, right? Pyruvate is where, in place of this nitrogen, I have a carbonyl here, but everything else is identical. So all you got to do is take off the nitrogen put an off, and, 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 and put a carbonyl there. That's exactly what's going on. So alanine seems to be the... Uh, one of the main amino acids. So I wonder, I'm wondering now, I don't know how you limit your alanine intake. I don't know what foods have high amounts of alanine, but if you're on a keto diet and you really want to do it fast, maybe you eat foods low in alanine on top of it. That might be way too extreme. <laughs> um, but I imagine alanine is in quite a bit of stuff. I'm sure your body has a way of taking other amino acids and turning into fibroid too, but um, so that way you can't have alanine as pyruvate. You strictly are using all your fat. It won't take any of your protein. I don't know. Okay, anyways, there are three common fates of carbon. All right, pyruvate, acetyl coenzyme A, and then a, a conversion to an intermediate into the citric acid cycle. Um, so, you know, all these, so amino acids are three to six carbons. So depending on what you can do, it can get converted into the, any of these. Alanine is converted into acetyl coen, uh, was it pyruvate? Or acetyl coenzyme. It was it was pyruvate. Yeah, so alanine was converted to pyruvate. Other ones might be converted to acetyl CoA. Others might be other intermediates that could just be injected strictly into the uh, in, in, um, 
in the citric acid cycle. Oh, yeah, I remember the slide. Yeah, this slide shows you where the amino acids are going. So all depending on what amino acid you have. So this is the citric acid cycle. Again, we didn't talk about this uh, because I figured that you guys have it in another place. But here's the pyruvate acetyl-CoA. That then it, it uh, hooks up with um, citric acid. That's why having citric acid is important. And then it goes through the whole process um, of the prep cycle to form all our ATP. And it looks like depending on the amino acid, it goes into different areas because the structures are similar to these structures. Does that make sense? Again, absolutely amazing how our body does this. I mean, this is billions of years of evolution. I'm just looking at the amino acid. Yeah, it's pretty much almost every amino acid. So I guess it doesn't matter if you limit al alanine. Everyone is found is found somewhere. Okay, gl glucogenic amino acids are are catabolized to pyruvate or an intermediate, as we saw. These products can be used for gluconeogenesis, which is synthesizing glucose. Ketogenic amino acids are converted to acetylcoenzyme A or R related thioester acetyl-CoAs. We've talked about all this. These products can be used to synthesize ketone bodies and can yield energy on that pathway. So you get uh, ketone bodies out of them as well because of the pyruvate, right? Because if you are making pyruvate, Remember, we saw that pyruvate uh, can be converted into a ketone body. Yeah, this is fine. So here's pyruvate. Um, uh, if you turn that CO2 group into a CH3 group, you have, have acetone. Okay, and that is it. Any questions? I have no idea if you guys were hanging on to every word, listening to everything. Uh, 